Hi, uh, my name is Winston Linquister and I'm a current undergraduate at Duke University. So to those who may be wondering, the purpose of this podcast is to both fight stigma surrounding mental disability, as well as give a face or voice to those involved in disability studies, a field of study that is quite often unnoticed or unknown to many. Now, mind you, I don't have any real experience with video or audio editing, and this entire podcast is basically amateur. However, I hope either way, these conversations can give to our audience a better understanding of disability studies and those involved in it. So thanks, I hope you enjoy, and have a great Disability Pride Week. Hello everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the Mad Studies Podcast for Disability Pride Week. I'm your host, Winston Linquister, and today our guest is Shane Newmeyer, a disability rights lawyer and activist who identifies as neurodivergent. Shane has fought for disability rights, focusing on abuse and medical coercion, particularly in institutional settings. So let's get started. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on the show with us, Shane. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well, thanks. How about you? Pretty good, pretty good. So let's get started with this. So um, first and foremost, uh, Shane, for our audience who may not be familiar with your work, uh, do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Um, well, I have been in disability justice work, social justice, but focusing on disability and youth rights for uh, about eight years now. Um, I went to law school and I worked in a number of nonprofits focusing on um, disability rights issues and um, ending abuse in institutional settings, whether that be in residential schools or psych wards or troubled teen type industry, uh, troubled teen industry type programs like boot camps and wilderness programs. I've also done activism around this uh, policy wise organized protests, um, speaking at events across the country, um, written some articles and such, and I have a social media presence, which is honestly most of what I do. All right. Sounds like you have a pretty full plate over there. So... You no, know, it sometimes feels like, why am I so tired when I'm doing nothing, but... <laughs> no, no, I, I totally understand. So it sounds like you've been involved with uh, social justice surrounding disability rights for a long time. Um, can you let us know about any specifics of social justice in regards to disability activism and disability rights, like any particular nuances of it? Um, well, a lot of what it comes down to for, for, from what I've seen, um, and there, this plays through a lot of social justice issues, but a big theme I've realized is that there's this false dichotomy between autonomy and the need for support. The uh, the idea that um, if you want independence or you want to be able to make your own decision, rather, you have to be completely self-sufficient. Um, people will say, well, um, if you can't manage your finances on your own or if your apartment looks like a tornado hit it, then obviously you can't take care of yourself. You need a guardian who will make your medical decisions for you and tell you how you have to live in a group home when what you really just need help with is you need somebody to set up a, um, a what's the word, a housekeeping appointment every couple of weeks and have somebody manage your bank accounts or help consult with you about how to do that. Um, or the fact that um, like somebody who has who's even just you know their legal status is that they're younger or they have a serious developmental disability on its own will be basis for denying them anything from the right to decide um let's see to vote or uh there are some statutes for instance across the country that prohibit people with serious mental illness and specific idd uh and intellectual and developmental disabilities from voting um, or even uh, people uh, with these will be denied medical care at all, uh, let alone that of their own decision. Wow. Um, how would you say you can fight against this sort of systemic stigma then? And uh, how would you say you can make it more visible to a wider audience who may not even be aware of it? Um, everything, everything counts. I mean, this is a multi-pronged thing, uh, some, of, some of which is just harm reduction measures. Um, I, I will often joke about the, you know, how training somebody, having them watch a PowerPoint once a year um, about some issues, not going to do anything but to have 
trainings that are actually meaningful where you you see somebody in the flesh who can give you a sense whether they're talking by an AT device, you know, uh, kind of what you think of as maybe the Stephen Hawking machine or that they, they talk like me, uh, whether they look kind of like me or they look more different or more typical, um, whether their communication style is typical or not, just have somebody there kind of in the flesh and speaking about what it's like from our perspective and not from these people might do this. Um, that can help representation in the media that is um, more than just the um, com person who's completely like you and me, except they have a wheelchair. No, I mean, it is important to normalize people, but it's also not, it, it's not necessary to have somebody not be disabled in any way that affects their identity. Uh, there's also the need for policy change, um, especially by people with various disabilities that are affected by this. Um, and activism that goes farther than that. Um, the most famous disability protest was actually people with mobility impairments, so, such as wheelchair users, chaining themselves to a building that they couldn't get up the stairs in and uh, occupying a federal building until the um, a law on accessibility got passed. So all approaches are, are valid. Um, I, I'm sure I didn't notice name some, but we need everything we can get. Definitely. Now, uh, speaking of in the flesh, in your initial email to me, you said that you were neurodivergent. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that or tell us our audience a little bit about neurodivergence and its impact in your life? Uh, well, as far as a general concept, it comes from the idea of neurodiversity, which the short version of explaining it is all brains are good brains. Like there's no one standard brain that all people should have that functions in the exact same way. Autistic brains are okay. Um, the brains of people with um, epilepsy, depression, anxiety are okay. People who have, for instance, get schizophrenia are okay. Like it's not people's own decisions about their brain and identities are fine. I mean, if somebody decides, you know, I'm autistic, I'm epileptic. Somebody with the same um, two conditions has said um, <laughs> autism is a an operating system. Epilepsy is a virus. I would say similar. I would say goodbye epilepsy, no problem. But if somebody said we're going to cure you and make you non-autistic, I, I, I'd show them the door. Um, and it's it impacts me for better or worse. I mean, um, there are things that I do frankly, better than most people. Um, I had pretty much all of Greek mythology memorized by age eight. Um, I memorized an entire TV show. I'm in the process of memorizing an entire Broadway soundtrack. I've read thousands of pages of documents and synthesized it on a case about 20 years of abuse in the boarding school. But on the other hand, if I don't have my headphones and a fire alarm goes off, I'm ducking and covering. Um, I'm, I'm scared out of my mind. Um, and if I uh, don't have help, um, the way my place would look would not be what you would think a lawyer would be capable of as far as managing their life. So um, in my case, it looks like a, kind, a big skill deferential that doesn't match up with what people think. And I do have some other stuff that I'm less thrilled with going on in my brain. And uh, I dealt with depression. I dealt with um, suicidal thoughts attendant to that, panic attacks, and those I'm just dealing with, but on my own terms, unlike in past years when I've had people saying, you have to take this medication um, to, and I haven't had control about saying what I do need and what I need other people to change, so I feel less, the symptoms less than I would have. So, you said within your own experiences, uh, there is this question of what other people think. Have you yeah. faced that, uh, those very same stigmas that we talked about earlier, and how have those basically been incorporated in your life? 
I get a very weird back and forth effect. I mean, people see my face. I have cleft and palate and some cranial facial stuff going on. Um, Haywell syndrome is the particular diagnosis. Uh, so I look kind of different, and people will do what people in the disability community call special voice. Hey, sweetie, how are you? And then oh, they talk to me, and if they re- if they find out I'm a lawyer or an advocate or something, they suddenly switch gears. I'm like, oh, oh, and they talk to me like I'm a full adult human. Um, but then they'll learn that I actually do have meltdowns if overstimulated or frustrated. Or actually I have difficulty remembering to eat more than once a day. Um, all sorts of things like that. And then, but your, like, insert thing I've done in my life, some accomplishment, but you've done so well in school, but you're an attorney, but you travel all over. How could you not do this? And it's like, um... I just don't. I'm good at th- some things. I'm good at other things. Just because you don't associate those doesn't mean that's not true. Um, and, you know, some of the things I've gotten are pretty standard of, you know, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, and people do the just get over it, think happy thoughts, have you tried this, have you tried that? And uh, meanwhile, I'm, you know, struggling to actually find something that works for me and have people get that I'm I am working towards it. It's just not easy as uh, snapping my fingers. Mm-hmm. Wow. So it, what I gather is a lot of what you're talking about kind of plays into this idea of identity and yeah. who you are and how your neurodivergence factors into that. Um, what would you say about the idea of identity in general for people with uh other any form of neurodiver uh, sorry neurodivergence. Um, would you say it's in, like, innately part of your identity, or maybe a separate entity that's kind of side by side? How how do you think about uh, how do you think about it basically? Oh boy, there uh, there are all kinds of divisions on how people conceptualize them, and some are more valid than others. I mean, I I can say fairly comfortable for me. Just disability in general and the ways in which it manifests have been very um, central to my experience and people have said but you're making yourself all about that and I'm like I'm not quite my body and my brain and sometimes you guys made that about uh, that made that made that how I am and who I am and I'm just trying to make it something positive other people uh, will say other people for one reason or another don't want to be associated with it sometimes because it is so stigmatized um, and they don't know they don't want to get fired for instance even though it's against the law doesn't mean it doesn't happen Um, or they don't want to be ostracized in the dating pool or the the, their friend circle as the quote-unquote crazy person um, well, I would say that that's more about the other people than not, and I, I'll say, like, if anybody has stigma like that, um, it's a good thing they don't want that, because at least I know up front, and other communities will have, like, a lot of, uh, people in the LGBTQ, etc. community have this historical baggage about how being gay and being trans is or was considered a mental illness and by a certain faction still is treated that way and so there's been this pressure to disavow that to say but we're normal just like everybody else which unfortunately throws queer um, LGBTQ etc people under the bus uh, if they have neurodivergence I mean I'm part of both communities and Oh boy, um, the the um, need to say what we're normal is very strong sometimes, and there's, I mean, both about physical and mental disability, and for those of us who are both, it's been a big thing of pushing back and saying, hey, that doesn't make me any less valid than anybody else here. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, two things to kind of gather that is, or that struck out to me were that that idea of normalcy. And um, earlier you were talking about positivity in the context of uh, what some some would call a mental disability. Um, do you think there's positivity to labeling it as normal, or would you say that's 
a negative? Like, where where would you factor in uh, positivity into this idea of normalcy? Uh, I mean, I I kind of can you face that a little bit? Sorry. Um, basically, do you th you said that you were trying to, uh, or one of your ways of thinking of the, your identity with neurodivergence is positivity. Uh, would or is positive thinking? Was that ever crossing the line of thinking of it as like normalcy, or would you just view those as two separate identities, such as your neurodivergence is a normal state for you, therefore it's positive? Were you? Uh, I first of all, I feel like I have to clarify when, uh, um, with regard to positivity. Unfortunately, it's weaponized against disabled people, especially people with mood disorders, like um, and, and like depression or anxiety disorders. And um, as far as that, I mean, the way I see it, and, and it also gets um, used against activism, people who are saying, you know things got to be better and I, I say like some people say the glass half full some people see the gla how, uh, glass half empty and I I'm not an optimist I'm not a pessimist I'm an idealist I say why did I only get half a cup of water um, and so and that's what I think a lot of the neurodivergent uh, position is of saying like we are what we are and what we can have is better than we what we have right now both in terms of what options are available for treatment if we do want treatment and for treatment in society by other people it whether or not we are on medication whether or not we're you know um going to yoga whether or not we're exercising enough or sleeping enough just being ourselves is enough to be worth accepting as far as normalcy some people will say there's no much no such thing as normalcy and i I agree and I don't. Um, I see normalcy as kind of like the concept of God. Whether you not, whether or not you believe in God, the force that the cultural force that the idea of God has is enormous. And I mean, if anything, uh, being from um, the liberal coast, as it were, and not the Bible Belt, I found the pressure of normalcy a lot more pressure, uh, a lot more. Um, part of my life than religious pressure, for instance. So even if I don't believe that there is one correct human being, the idea that there is has been a giant force that has shaped my life in not particularly good ways, except as something to fight against. I will say that is an awesome analogy to make. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> um, so I guess where this is all kind of leading to is... Uh, how was how is your experience with uh, neurodivergence kind of shaped your decision to move into your career as a disability advocate and disability rights lawyer? I mean, it gave me purpose when I realized that there was a name for what I was. Um, some of the ones I had encountered didn't fit me before, but there for some of them were in good faith, some of them were more bad faith. Um, but what I was, I was autistic, and I had a bunch of other stuff going on, too. I started looking into the communities and what their issues were, and I found some stuff that was... I had, hadn't known that this kind of stuff was still going on, and it gave me a reason to want to go to law school. I mean, it had been up till then, like a, sure, I'm a good writer, this is the way to go if I want to wait out the recession back in 2008. And then it became, no, this is something I want to do because I can do something with that, uh, with it, and about it. And that led me to go to law school and get in, involved, increasingly involved in act, activism. Aside from that, uh, parallel to the actual legal parts of my, my job and my studies before that. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. So as a lawyer, um, what would you say are the greatest issues that we're facing right now in terms of uh, disability rights. You said there's this dichotomy between law versus what actually happens. So could you give some examples of these issues that you're bringing up? Oh boy, so um, <laughs> the things that, it, uh, 
I mean, people think of institutions in a very kind of outdated way, but one one that is that both outdated and not. I mean, we don't really have rubber rooms with straight jackets anymore. We're, I mean, people do get injected with medication, but not these huge thing, syringes um, that put you out for forever and a day. Um, I could talk about actual over-medication, but that's quite different than what people think. We don't have lobotomies, but what we do have is institutional abuse that looks like, for instance, people being um, restrained, held down by sometimes five people for anything from actual aggression that's not being properly addressed that's sometimes quite reasonable under the circumstances or sometimes not um, to, for instance, people being um, prevented from going into the community at all. Um, one of the big things that I've noticed across the board has been people deprived of communication with the outside world and have it made contingent on their behavior. You can't talk to your mom. If you talk, if you call her and say, hey, look, they're beating me up here. Um, I, I, they're doing all this weird kind of stuff to me. I, they'll hang up the phone. Uh, you suddenly can't talk to your lawyer, and if you try to, they're going to break your phone. Um, I could go on. Um, but <laughs> institutional abuse continues. It looks less um, sensational in a lot of cases, not always. Um, for instance, the use of a what amounts to a human dog shock collar in one facility in Massachusetts called the Judge Rotenberg Center, which I've been working to close for pretty much as long I've been, as I've been a disability rights activist. Uh, you can read more about that at a whole bunch of places. Um, and it, it, there's all, the big problem that we're facing right now is that we're looking at a government that wants to cut everything that benefits people who are not billionaires um, and other people with systemic power. And that's going to kill disabled people, quite honestly. Um, people who are not, uh, who don't have adequate, adequate health insurance access if they get kicked out of Medicaid. Uh, a lot of them will go be sh shuttled into nursing homes, die earlier deaths because of that. I mean, there's a big reason that nursing home abuse is a big practice area in the law. Um, there will be people who can't get um, special education who will be sidelined because they will have no career training and really no basic and academic skills even that will get them to college, that will make them able to be employed as doing anything involving reading, math, all those skills. Um, and there will be people who are not having their basic access needs enforced. I mean, the current position of our federal government right now is who needs civil rights. Um, so if without the enforcement vote, Americans with Disabilities Act, for instance, becomes, becomes meaningless. Um, sure, on paper, they can't fire you for having a mental illness. Um, for instance, if you have panic attacks um, and you're dealing with clients who scream at you um, or customers, as it were, they're not supposed to be able to fire you, but um, without meaningful enforcement, I mean, it still happens, but it happens a lot less than it would. So right now we're facing an assault on disability rights on all fronts and dis disabled lives that we as lawyers, we as activists who are not lawyers, everybody needs to be ready to fight against on all fronts. Um, if you don't, or oh, actually, this now, where's the media on all of this, uh, the coverage for it? You said earlier that there was uh, negative media depictions of people with uh, neurodivergence. Um, how would you say the media factors into uh, these issues of policy or into these issues of disability rights? Um, it can be a force for good, and I leverage well visibility can do a lot. I mean, for instance, the fact that um, the media coverage of people with mental illness in particular is so negative in terms of t portraying us as dangerous um, is a huge... I mean, there just was some movie by um, M. Night Shyamalan that was about, like, a killer with so many different personality disorder personalities. I mean, 
Ugh, that's not even how multi uh, how um, multiple systems work. Uh, there was the accountant movie with an, a guy with Asperger's that apparently made him the perfect serial like the perfect hitman. It was it, there's basic, that plus the coverage of school shootings, other mass shootings. Um, drives home the idea that people with neurodivergence of any kind are dangerous and often they get confused. I mean, you say mental illness, people think uh, that we're talking about people who, um, you know, hear voices in the television telling them to assassinate the president. Um, I mean, one, that's not even how a lot of people's... um, neurodivergence manifests itself and to the fraction of people who commit violence based on mental illness is tiny like they did a study and i think they came up with four percent of crimes are committed by people who are neurodivergent in some way or other um and people um are much more likely to be victims than perpetrators of crime if they're disabled in any sense, including neurodivergent. So, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Were you going to say something else? And as far as media coverage, it, um, issues that in ways that can help our cause, it can be helpful. I mean, there were people around the world paying attention to the electric shock stuff in 2012 when a video of the um, shock in use on a young man who was in four-point restraints being shocked repeatedly while he begged for it to stop. That got attention and it almost got a law passed um, to to end it, but not quite. And then there were some follow-up attempts through the law on the federal level, and it never went anywhere. So it can, but it can't just be a flash in the pan. There has to be follow-up. I mean, I used to think that if you like, you know, if you see a movie, there there is a thing where you expose the bad guy for what he's done, and the the media jumps on it and. He goes to jail, everything solved, the day is saved. No, um, the media can bring attention to things, but it's not the end-all, be-all, and focused attention on it um, would be more effective than just the newscast and then forgetting about it. So, um, how do you say that the media could amend those uh, previous, uh, basically poor portrayals of neurodivergence? Um, like, what kind of angle do you think that the general media could take to kind of fix the fix this image crisis, basically? Um, I I think that there needs to be um, more attempt and more bringing disabled people into the conversation about things. For one, um, consultants, that kind of thing. Whenever you're thinking about doing a movie um, or a show that involves somebody from a given community actually reach out to the orgs that represent them. I mean, um, Autistic Self-Advocacy Network um, or Autism Women's Network for the autistic community, for instance. Um, I couldn't tell you as easily what some of the other main um, orgs for various communities are in because you'd have to ask people who are actually from those communities. Um, But there are self-advocacy orgs, reach out to prominent advocates, read blogs on media representation and reach out for the people who to who write them um that's step one um and like it's hard because people don't even think of neurodivergent people often outside of these tropes but and and it's also i never want to say you know you have to have so many odd people of each kind of person um, because then it just ends up being tokens. But to the extent one can, um, it should be, uh, people should be thinking about how disabled people fit into their world. I mean, I'm a geek, so I think about sci fi fantasy kind of situations. And um, like one of the, pr- the premises I have no idea what to do with now, but I'm thinking of is okay, the apocalypse happens. What happens to all the disabled people who need meds and care after that happens? Or um, 
let's I mean just for instance the amount of trauma that a person in an action movie or a sci-fi or fantasy film with a lot of fighting would experience people don't think about that and um, portray it in how they write the character. Um, that's one of the things I really like about Hunger Games, and a lot of people do, is it's very clear that Katniss is dealing with PTSD. It might not be called that, but it's there. And I, that's actually one of the saddest things, um, is that the best portrayals of disability, including neurodivergence, are often the ones that people don't intend. Um, they don't think about it like that, and people will say, oh, that's me, and that was never intended, but it be, it's much, so much more natural than people taking the DSM definition and saying, does this person have this symptom, that symptom, oh, uh, he's autistic, let's have him, fl- him flap his hands and play with trains. No, like, people who write thing, characters who look like us, um, like, the ones that are most natural are not the ones that are tailored to a diagnosis. All right. So, um, one thing that really stood out to me that you said earlier is kind of bringing disabled people in the conversation. Mm-hmm. And that, or just, as you said, or you were just talking about with media portrayals, just bringing them into the forefront in a natural manner. Um, get, I guess, could you expand on that idea of basically bringing disabled people forward, like, to the forefront of the conversation? Um, I mean, that's been a theme in uh, disability advocacy for decades now, the big slogan that's been kind of resurrected from the early days almost uh, during the big protests is nothing about us without us. Um, And unfortunately, that is still necessary because of the the tendency to not even think about that, um, often because of what people call the presumption of incompetence of uh, that disabled people don't even know what's going on in the world, much less political issues, much less how to describe themselves. There's this assumption that we have nothing to add, and there's also this idea that other people, professionals, parents, um, special educators, other people are good p- proxies for us. That they can, st- like, I'll read something and it'll be like, families with disabilities, or, oh, we don't have a self-advocate speaking on this panel, but we have a sibling of a, par- of a person with a disability, um, a parent of a child experiencing autism. I don't like, even let me go into the euphemisms talking about disability. It could go on forever. But this idea that other people are, if not better at speaking for us, then it's interchangeable with us, and that's not the case. Um, just uh, the fact that a lot of people, including professionals, including advocates who have worked in this field for 20 years or longer, don't know why people do, uh, why specific disabilities manifest in a certain way, where if you did a simple Google search, you would find resources by adults and even young adults saying, this is why I have a meltdown. This is what it means when I'm doing X. Um, People aren't doing their research from the people who know exactly what's going on, and that factors into everything from media representation to policy development. I mean, when you have a uh, facility saying, we don't know what to do with these people except restrain them and um, put them in quiet rooms and whatever because they self-injure all the time, um, they're not, nobody's asking why are people self-injuring and people from the depression community could tell you that, people from the autistic community could tell you that, uh, people from the anxiety community could tell you that and there's all sorts of resources about why that happens and yet nobody's really asking that question or even seeking it out without having to ask anybody. And if they did, it could save a lot of people pain. And 20 years later, people wouldn't have to be writing these articles and sharing what happened to them and hope that it doesn't happen to somebody else. So uh, what you're kind of touching on right now and something that you brought up uh, time and time again is kind of shortcomings within the way psychiatrists or just the medical community addresses disability uh, or mental disabilities. Um, 
So in case we do have any psychiatrists that are actually watching this podcast, um, how would you kind of bridge that gap between disability advocacy and your goals and psychi psychiatrists and their current approaches to focusing on um, their, their current approaches to neurodivergence? And uh, essentially, what would you say would be treatments that work better than the than the ones that are frequently used or abused? I mean, some of them are really contextual as to whether they work for a person or not. I mean, I've had a bunch of people who say, who swear by uh, DBT, dialectical behavior therapy. I tried it a few times, it just doesn't click. Um, by contrast, I found a really good med medication uh, regimen that has me doing pretty well, still working towards stuff, but I'm doing pretty all right. But it took me 10 years to get to the point where I'd even consider it because I had such a bad experience before. And it really needs to be about what works for an actual person and not only looking at what clinical symptoms a person pre presents, but why. And I mean, I kind of feel like that's maybe just one on one level, but you'd be surprised how much that just isn't considered. And for anybody to kind of look at the situation and not just say, okay, we can treat you in a vacuum and then you go out and you're fine. I mean, if you have a kid who is depressed out of their mind and you're not addressing the bullying that they go through every day, you're just giving them the medication and they're still getting teased or beat up every day, then that's not, that you, that's not even, a, well, it is a band-aid solution, but it's a band-aid solution on a wound that the band-aid doesn't even cover. Um, so to look at that and also to treat the person you're working with, your client, your patient, um, whoever, however you would describe that relationship as the primary person that, that you're answering to, not the, not their parent, not their guardian. Uh, you listen to the person first and you don't necessarily, you know, you don't doubt that person or take the side against them because they're not paying you, because they're young, because they're disabled. Um, you're their helper and you, if necessary, have to be their advocate. I mean, my provider is great because he has been an advocate for me as, of, as with other providers, as with my family, if necessary, as with my employer, and that's sometimes what's necessary. I mean, it, you might say, hey, that's above my pay grade. You're asking me to be a psychiatrist and a social worker and an advocate, a patient's advocate and a like family therapist, and that's not what I signed up for. Um, if so, if, if you know other people in the field who do that, link them together, talk. Um, make people to them and talk to each other because, I mean, yeah, you might not be able to do everything, but sometimes everything is what a person needs and they should be able to get something holistic and not just that narrow and focused on, okay, what symptoms do I see? Um, I mean, the other big thing, and this is because of the focus I have, is really try to avoid restrictive interventions. I mean, I'm in the uh, the psych survivor community and the autistic community uh, and related cross disability communities and I see so many people um, in crisis who either PM me or a friend PMs me or I see a Facebook post saying don't call the cops I don't want professional involvement I'm, I, I or my friends feeling really low and them considering doing something pretty drastic and I, uh, I mean, I see that and I know the person is probably not going to do it if they have the right support. And I would prefer instead of having to come to me or my friends who are, none of us are psychiatrists, none of us are providers, we're just, you know, other people who m know people who have had the same thing or ourselves have. And um, like, I would like to think I can help, but it's, often more than I know what to do with. So if providers could serve in that role and work with natural support, such as friends and family members and community members and exchange ideas without there being this lack of trust, that would be the ideal situation. That's really incredible that you mentioned with this kind of support network within the community. Um, 
What can you say about that degree of community within the disability advocacy or even disability pride networks? I mean, it's it's a community like any other, and it's not. I mean, just just like anything else, there's a there's people who pull together um, because we need each other's support, uh, and yet there's rivalries and there's don't don't talk to that organization. They're actually crap, or uh, we put up with that guy, but we really don't like him. But on the other hand, you know, if somebody if there's a person who is in a domestic violence situation, there's about five people who are going to offer. I have a car. I have a couch. Let's work this out. Um, if there's somebody in crisis, you know, it'll there'll be a call put out of my friend is talking about suicide. Can people send messages affirming their worth, or can somebody uh, can somebody make it over from the local area, uh, or suggest resources, that kind of thing? Uh, and it's in part the. Uh, <sighs> In part, it's because we know what the cost is without that. I mean, both the loss of life and what it could mean to somebody to be in a hospital for six weeks, for instance, and lose their job and not know who's paying, taking care of their pets or their children. Um, if they are in school being forced onto a leave of absence, the, the, the stakes can be pretty high. So the ability to deal with it within our own circle and make informal supports to prevent those outcomes and prevent the worst outcome of somebody losing their life um, is, uh, we, we know from personal experience or indirectly how important that is. Definitely, definitely. Um, and while we're on this topic of communities, uh, just kind of as a little bit of a description of this podcast itself, uh, yeah. it's... Uh, the original intention was to kind of uh, focus on MAD studies in particular and scholars within uh, disability pride and disability awareness. However, you bring a very uh, unique perspective from your legal experience. Um, have you had much interaction within the greater MAD studies uh, movement? And if so, would you be able to shed some light on it to our audience? If not, that's totally fine. But. I, I mean, a lot of what I know is second or third hand. I mean, uh, uh, like having grown up not not being disabled, uh, uh, well, not being knowing myself as disabled, I had to put a lot of ideas kind of together from scratch. And turns out that philosophers who predated me by decades, if not centuries, came to the same conclusion, uh, and otherwise people you know on Tumblr or people who are actually professors um, will I talk to them and I now have kind of a secondhand understanding of some of the academic stuff and I've read you know a fair amount of articles and such but a lot of the heavy theory you know ugh. I, <laughs> I I look at it and even having been to law school my eyes glaze over a bit so um, I'm kind of a um, I'm interested in the ideas, and I am not so acquainted with kind of the masters of the field, but I take what I do know and um, use it as I can in my advocacy. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for your insights. Even though they don't necessarily uh, are pertain from MAD studies, you definitely do bring a great deal of knowledge to the table. Thank you so much again for that. So, oh, thank you having me on. No problem. So we're kind of just about to run out of time. So I'll just ask one last question. It's a little bit more open-ended. Um, so just in general, do you have any final mes uh, messages to our listeners? Like any last points you want to get across that we may not, not have covered that you were hoping that we could have talked about? Um, well, I'm not thinking of anything that's particularly new, but if you're interested in this, there's tons of people who have written about these many other subjects, um, people who have lived the experience um, and can talk about it in great detail, whether uh, what you want to know is what it's actually like to be in an institution or how it is to to form your identity, what the difference is between somebody who was diagnosed at age three, for instance, versus someone who didn't learn about it till they were 50, or what I, it means when I do X, or what I need when I do Y. 
Um, there's stuff out there to look into, um, and I would also um, advise looking into what the issues are facing people because there are some pretty serious ones, and in certain ways it's only going to get more serious for the next four years. Hopefully, knock on wood, that's as long as it goes. So pay attention, and if you can, get involved. All right. Thank you so much, Shane. All right, everybody, this is Shane Neymar, and thank you so much for your time tonight.